We're going to start with our next session already. I hope you're back. Not entirely sure because, you know, this is not a live meeting room, so it's hard to tell when your cameras are off if you're here or not. I just hope you are. And I'm going to say welcome to Floyd talking about growing local. I hope Floyd is here. Floyd, can you give me a sign? <laughs> hey, great. Hi. I'm alive. Hi. Yeah, I told you it's a mini break, and I wasn't mini, joking. Mini break. So glad you're back. And I'm also yeah. here, which is yeah. which is also surprising at this point. Yeah, so knock on wood. Down. Yeah. Little down, little down. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's good to have you. And thank you, everybody. And I'm glad everybody was able to make it. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, that was a great introduction, a great, you know, first run and gave us an overview of the work that needs to be done. I mean, we have a, a mountain to climb, but, you know, hey, it's not the first time we've come across these issues. And I think we can definitely address them. Um, maybe not like this, because the corona kind of makes things a little bit more crazier, but uh, food scarcity and issues like that is not, you know, new. And I think we can definitely... Uh, collectively can come across, come come upon some solutions to solve it. Uh, so you ready for me? Let me see. See when you are, yeah. Awesome. So far we don't see, now, now it's coming, Floyd. The presentation is there. Okay, now we see your screen, and here we are. See seeing, we're seeing your slides. All right. Good. Yeah, and when you start, wonderful. I'll be quiet now. No, no, no. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to discuss what we can do, maybe as a collective or you as an individual, uh, and give you an overview of what, what – some possible things to look for in the landscape and you know some policies to look out for and the give a and just an understanding of the policy changes that also are being implemented during the same time as we're going through this crisis so there are going to be a wave of policies that's going to follow after this uh, to address the concerns because i think a lot of the uh, rather, it's the Rockefeller Foundation, John Hopkins, everybody's seeing that there is a coming wave of issues uh, following after this virus. Um, and we're already getting a glimpse of it in our culture, where it's, you know, the toilet paper, you know, the shortening, the, the you know, the limited amount of toilet paper. I think we've seen that. Um, and then, and that's going all the way from frozen goods and frozen products. Uh, and that's just the, the the result of the disruption within our system as a whole. So the overview. First, I want to discuss uh, the transforming transforming our food system. So uh, some things that we need to do within our food system to prepare ourselves for what's coming in the future, but also what could help act as a buffer in case if anything else comes about. So, uh, of course, Seth, he did an excellent overview on the impacts of COVID-19, but I want to touch on uh, a little, uh, some, some things that's happening to us culturally and as a society and how that also reflects in how our relationship to food. And then I want to get some historical references so that we can get an understanding of what we did in the past whenever we came across similar, uh, crisis, similar crises. And even in our more recent history, maybe in the past, you know, 80 to 70 years, things that we did, you know, uh, as a people and as a country, even globally, um, to address these issues. And then I'll have some questions, some reflections, some things for us to think about uh, as we go along. And then coordinating with local institutions, like what can you as an individual do? Rather, you want to, you know, start, you know, want to be a farmer, but you don't know where to start. You don't have no idea where, you know, you just... But you want, you're enthusiastic, you want to get into it, some things that you can do as an individual. And then as you have, you know, gained that knowledge and you figured out, you know, this is what you want to do, rather it's just simply gardening, starting a garden community, um, you need land. So how do you get land? 
you know, and how do you get even access to relatively free land, which is a lot of land that, that people will gift or uh, will give you access to to do something with, right? And then, uh, and let's say you don't have one, you don't even are not interested in doing that, but you do want to grow for yourself. Well, these are some things, some options. I would present some options uh, for you as an individual that you can do to start growing from home. So the transformation of our food system, there, there needs to be a decentralization of food production. And the benefits of that, of course, is the increase of biodiversity, increase of, of accessibility, and the strengthening of our local economies. You know, uh, even on a basic level, if you look at like restaurants, now, you know, we're seeing a trend now, even though like, Take out your mind, like, even though, you know, restaurants right now are getting hit hard because of the COVID-19 and, uh, and the economic crisis that's also following. But before that, right, we, uh, restaurants uh, were really pushing, like, farm to table and being able to have personalized the food experience and so that you can, as an individual, can look up that farm. Oh, this farm is right outside of town or right outside the city, I can actually physically go to this farm. I know where it's at. So there was already this, this, um, this trend that was happening, uh, even on a, a research level, where people were starting to notice that there was a need for decentralizing the food away from big agricultural co uh, corporations and that uh, a, a lifting up of the small farmer. Now, well, of course, we are familiar with like the whole, if you're not familiar with the Homestead Act, the Homestead Act uh, was uh, was a land grant, was a, was a land grant and subsidizing of agricultural land uh, to help develop uh, the United States between the 1800s, the, uh, the early to mid uh, 1800s going into um, going into the 20th century, uh, where uh, European peasants would come to the come to the Americas if they were interested in farming. They not they were also granted an education, of learning how to uh, to work the land, and then granted land to develop the land going westward. So this was an entire process. What we need now is a reversal of that. So here on the land, so instead of pulling, so people coming, not, not in reverse, but how the populations are, we have major populations within the city centers who are interested in agriculture, who's interested in farming, but they do not have the financial support. They do not have but largely the financial support or the education, right, to, to, or the knowledge to understand what it takes to make land profitable. So, hope, so with the new Homestead Act, Homestead Act 2.0, uh, these are some policy changes, some legislative changes or uh, grants that can happen to start uplifting people from the ground up, right, from the grassroots. Uh, I think a, a really good example of this, even that's happening now, you have a bill by uh, Cory Booker. Um, uh, uh, it's called uh, Justice for Black Farmers Act. And this is a good, this is a good beginning because it, oh, it gives a nice overview of what we're ha what's happening, but it's only it's what's happening on the legislative end. But this is only the beginning, and there's more that needs to be done, um, and there and it has to be as inclusive as possible. And we can't leave people out. And we need to be able to grant need to be able to really really push on getting people and getting people access to land. Because as you, we are all witnessing, and as Seth has pointed out, that we are coming into going into a crisis where uh, poverty is going to increase and, and food insecurity has already been an issue, particularly in the United States, and it's going to get worse. And the only way to do that is to decentralize the food industry and to be, start being able to develop small farms and strengthening us on that end. Addressing food waste. Uh, I think with with this, which is interesting because we're in an interesting period in this transitional period where we were, as even as Seth again pointed out, that we're having farmers, you know, throwing food away. And that, and as, and that's also stated, that is a very complex issue. But as to why that is, but I think with the transformation, we will start to see uh, less food waste 
and there and there's possibly this area of equilibrium but that can be a good thing or a bad thing and i think i will further address this in the next slide um with the decentralization we can end food i, I believe that we can start the process of ending food insecurity with the decentralization with uh, uplifting where people can start being able to eat where they are. And granted, the small, small farms in the city centers may not be able to, uh, to feed the city population, but as a team effort, a collective effort with local farms outside into the county areas, I think this is something that definitely can be done. From the, the, the average garden enthusiast to the farmer out in the county, working in so much in collaboration with each other, uh, rather knowingly or unknowingly, can really start to begin the process of securing food, nutritional food, for the surrounding population or for the community at large. Uh, there needs to be more uh, progressive policy changes, like the justice uh, for Black farmers, but that's only the beginning. There needs to be more on a financial end, and but also just a, a level of access that has to increase in order for us to truly decentralize the food industry. And then, uh, but uh, but also on the ground as the farmers to increase increase yields and to also to protect to protect our environment. There need, there is a shift going happening from traditional agricultural practices, uh, where it's very like monoculture, you know, one crop, you know, to where we're now we're doing uh, a more rege uh, a regenerative agriculture and doing crop rotations, uh, no till methods. Uh, no-till, which is no-tilling of the land, uh, composting, and building the soil up, okay? So the impacts of COVID-19, uh, just in short, um, there has been over 600, 600, 690 million people suffering from, uh, under, from being under, now merged, and Oxfam predicts that 12,000 people could die per day by the end of 2020 as a result from hunger linked to COVID-19. So as Seth, Seth pointed out, you know, the, the, as Seth pointed out, the issue is getting worse and think tanks are already predicting, think tanks and NGOs are already predicting that there are going to be large waves of deaths that's going to follow per day globally. And this isn't even, then this uh, isn't even included in the United States where there is gonna be a rise in deaths from just hunger and not being able to get access to food, this is going to be a growing issue. And they're already preparing and predicting this. And we have to be very mindful of, what the, of this changing landscape that, that's, that's happening before us. Uh, the restrictions and the decline of the food service market. One, one, you know, the, the reason for the, the, the increase of food waste and why farmers are throwing out their foods because there's the distribution lines have been disrupted. The entire landscape is changing. So where production, of course, is gonna go down, um, uh, poverty is going to increase because these food service workers, you know, of course, you know, if you're not working you, you, and we know that the stimulus, you know, stimulus and this and the third, all of those issues, combined is creating a very dire situation on the ground. Um, and it's choking, <laughs> it's choking uh, the food industry in many regards. Um, as I'm researching on the subject, you know, I keep seeing, you know, food waste equilibrium, food waste equilibrium. Uh, and I, can't, I don't know if that's even a good thing and as much as it's being painted. And you can read all the way from Forbes to, um, fast company or fast company, you, you, across the board, they are praising this. Um, but in my opinion, the, the reason why we're coming across the equilibrium is because of the decline of the food service market and that there is also an increase in demand from food on the ground because of poverty and because of the lack of access to food. And like, you know, lo uh, organizations like Local Meal providing meals on the ground, food boxes on the ground, and there is a dire need for this. So of course that there's gonna be less waste, but is that, a, is that a transition into what we want per se? I have to say no, not like this. We can't have it like this because people have to eat. You know, um, 
And then, and then with COVID-19, it's changing the way that we view food. And there's con this idea of the conscious consumer, which is good, you know, uh, and I think this was something that was trending even before uh, COVID-19, where people were becoming more conscious about what they were eating. Um, uh, but I think because of the, of course, because of naturally, because of the fear of this virus, people want to know, you know, was this food processing plant, what is their protocols? How have they been treating animals? You know, how it has, uh, has, is their facility clean? Are they cleaning their facility? What has been their reaction to COVID-19 and have they been keeping the place in line and healthy for, for everyone? Um, so, I mean, th and this is a, this is a, a legitimate concern. Um, and with that as well, there is an increase of, and this is kind of a, something that I found of note, there is a drastic increase in CSA purchases, which is good. Um, I think for the local farmer and the local, you know, the local farmer, the small farmer, this is good. Uh, but there's also an increase in, let's say, places like Amazon and Whole, Food, um, was it Whole Foods um, and online purchases of food. So of course there's, and that's, and I think in March it has increased almost like 30%. So people are purchasing online, being more conscious of the food, which is good, but we also have to be aware of the chains and the cultural shifts away from like grocery stores into really just being in your dwelling and ordering your food. And uh, there's, and not even being able to go to the restaurant that they, they there are, these are, uh, this is an extremely large shift and that could have lasting repercussions if we're not mindful. So historical references. Uh, I, to keep, you know, I think that in order for us to understand, you know, where we're going, we should be mindful of where we come from and where, where, what we have done in before to address these issues. So of course, during, you know, the 1800s, uh, to the 1800s, 1900s, we were leaving out of the agrarian type of lifestyle um you're coming out of the agrarian type of lifestyle and going into more of the industrial age so of course city the city centers is where all the jobs were the industrial jobs so people were coming into the city centers so you have the european migration and keep in mind the european migration right they're coming to the americas but this was happening across globally but particularly in the u.s some 30 million europeans came to the came to the americas and the other great migration uh where African Americans was leaving out of the southern region and was uh, and and moving across the United States, rather right? the the west and north, they were moving to different regions of the United States. Both groups brought their cultural and agricultural practices with them. Um, so, of course, you have the Homestead Act, right? But then you have people within the city centers that were already unconsciously. They already knew that, you know, the grocery stores and, and these type of ideas were not as prevalent, right, as we have it now as having this instant access so people would grow where they were and would, you know, and would create uh, community gardens um, and vacant lots. If you had a vacant lot, people would grow their vegetable gardens in those lots. So it wasn't as like, you know, as maybe even as restrictive or to where we now have, you know, guerrilla gardening, which is like, you know, this idea of people just say, you know what, I see that lot, that lot's been sitting there for the past 10 years, nothing is done with it, I'm going to turn it into a garden, which is very bold, especially in this day and time, because of the fear of the systems that are in place to prevent that type of action. Years ago, that fear wasn't there. If the, if the lot was there, nobody had, had claim to it, you know, you wasn't doing nothing, you would just plant your vegetable garden, and that'll be it. Now, that culture shifted during the Great Depression. Uh, because of the and gardens, we uh, were more built around survival, your true survival, because of the desperation from the uh, from the crash from the Great Depression during the 1930s, and it was in response to the crisis. And then, following after that, even even more of a crisis, you had the Victory Gardens or the Food Gardens for Defense, which I kind of thought was kind of cool cool name, uh, was a response to food shortages during World War II. So. There was a transition away from just, you know, everyone having, right, where people were somewhat food secure in many regards to the Great Depression hits and a world war 
which and, the, and keep in mind, this isn't the Victory Gardens was not something that was just occurring in the United States. This was happening globally. There was a global shoot food shortage during World War Two. So and um, so people this was people's reaction uh, to an actual dire need for gardens and for these types of, of subsidized supports from the state and local level. OK. And of course, uh, which I thought these were really cool images. Uh, you got Lang uh, Mr. Langston Hughes uh, uh, with the garden in, in Harlem. Got a picture from LA, which is, I think is really cool. You see the horse um, in the background. And if you're ever in Baltimore, you have the a rabbers And if you're ever, you're ever in town, you can actually see people riding their horses. And I think that's one of the coolest things about Baltimore. Just, you know, throwing that out there. Um, reflections. So uh, how did uh, COVID-19 affect you and your ability to access food? You know, it, did it affect you? You know, if so, you know, what, what did you do, you know, to address it? Uh, do you think urban agriculture could be an effective way to addressing food security? Uh, you know, and if not, that's fine, too. You know, and I think that's part of it, too. You know, you don't have it. This doesn't have to be a yes or no. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I, I personally enjoy the no. Like, and this is why, you know what I mean? And then we can figure out what, you know, whatever solution can come about from that. You know, so addressing a problem or a, uh, a fall short or wherever we fall short, that is really good because then we can figure out what are some avenues that we can take to addressing that problem. Right. So really think about that. You know, you don't have to answer whatever, but I really want you to think about and reflect on these on these questions. Um, and what areas near you is impact worse by food insecurity? You know, um, I know, I, you know, we, I think Baltimore, you know, people kind of know about Baltimore, but there's a lot of areas in this country that people have no idea are food insecure, no idea are as poverty stricken as it is, um, and, and, and extremely poverty stricken. And they don't even ever get mentioned. You know, we always people talk about Baltimore, Chicago, you know, all these places, but there are places all across this country that are really being hit currently, right, because of this crisis, but even before that, that was already being impacted, uh, that was already being impacted, you know, and then, you know, of course, and look to, you know, I think Shining Beacons, like places like Detroit, that has really taken, taken this issue head on and uh, to address this issue in a very practical way. So I, I so you know just and, and I think Detroit is always you know they always point to Detroit another area that's getting another city that's always pointed towards is Detroit but I think Detroit is 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 a really good beacon uh, and I think Baltimore is coming into that as well by the way you know uh, and in your opinion uh, what are some cultural and systematic changes that that need to happen that you think that need to happen if it isn't any that's cool too uh, but what are some areas that you think that need to change specifically culturally and systematically, okay. Um, urban agriculture transformed the people, in, transformed people in places. It is a powerful catalyst for sustainable community vitality. Our work builds self-sufficiency through food production and education. This is a quote by Mr. Uh, K. Rashid Nori, Nor Nor uh, he has a book called Growing Out Loud. I highly recommend this book. Uh, this gentleman uh, has done very fundamental work, particularly with the USDA. Uh, he did uh, a study under the Clinton administration. He was appointed by, appointed by Clinton to do a study on, uh, on the impact that Black farmers got from the treatment from the USDA, from not being able to get certain resources and the uh, the segregation within the USDA and the treatment of black farmers, which, you know, Sally has really destroyed black farmers in this country. I mean, and they were specifically targeted. And, and that has to be really understood that, you know, black farmers are down anywhere between 1% of all the farming demographics or racial demographics or what have you, um, that black farmers are around 1%. And that was systematically done uh, uh, from not being, not getting access to loans and resources that other farmers were able to get access to. And he did a study and that, and result of that study was, the, there was a lawsuit in the billions that resulted from that study. 
uh, into the USDA and the U and the USD had to pay out. And and in respect to the USDA, they have been doing some work to some, some transformative work uh, into trying to address that address the issue as a whole as well. So, you know, gotta give props for this too. So coordinating with government with, with government agencies and public institutions. Keep this in mind. Who is on the ground doing the work? Know your landscape. Um, is there a farm? Are there farms already working in your uh, urban farms in your area? You know, do you know who they are? If not, you know them. And if there isn't one, you could be the one to do it. You know, so don't feel be deterred. You know, so um, if there isn't one, why not you? You know, um, but if there is, you know, it's about building community. Where this is about this work is about building community and building your network and working with other people. Um, and you don't have all the answers, but the answer's out there and there are people more than willing to share that information with you and work with you. And uh, so know your landscape, know who's out there, know who's in the game, you know, and, and willing to work and build with you, right? To, to bring this vision into reality. All right. So to, and, and, and all, I want to give you an idea of what's in Baltimore's landscape, particularly on the institutional end and like who are on the ground so you can get access to larger networks of farmers. And maybe, you know, there might be something similar uh, in your region or where you are. Um, and if not there, then that is a point of advocacy so that there needs to be an institution in your area that can address these specific areas that or areas that you need to that you need to be addressed right uh, so we have the university of maryland extension uh, uh specifically like their master gardeners program and i i found that program you know uh uh, uh and crystal former she's also my, my mentor in in that so shout out to crystal um and uh i think they are an excellent excellent program um, and it was one of also me personally, my foundation helped develop my foundation in gardening and made me enthusiastic about this work. Uh, you, you get access, yes, you get access to the, uh, get access to other gardeners and other people interested in this. But uh, I think, but also the education is really good. And, um, and so that you can understand everywhere is different. Growing practices is different everywhere and how you treat the land is extremely critical. And, uh, and if you don't treat the soil right, and if you don't treat the environment right, the, the, the bio environment, the insects and know who you, who's your friend, who's your foe on the ground, you can't never get off the ground and you'll be mad why why didn't your college grow? But somebody came and ate them, but you don't know who. The master gardeners, if you had a program, it'd be great, they can show you, you can learn how to work with the environment, right? And then you have the Office of Sustainability. And they're a great resource to kind of give you an idea of the policies that are in play and the other institutions in the city that can help you achieve whatever your vision might be for your garden or a small farm or what have you. Or what, even if it's just a basic gardening program with youth, they can help coordinate, they can give you the resources and direct you you know, to, into where you need to go. And I think, and they're another really, really good resource in the city. Uh, and then there's Tree Baltimore, uh, which, is a, which is a partner or a, kind of a department of Baltimore Recreations and Parks. Um, they, and they provide more of like native plants, native trees, shrubs, bushes for the environment. Um, and if you ever come into Baltimore, Baltimore, particularly in the, like the surrounding areas, there's trees everywhere. And uh, they really encourage you as an individual to plant as many trees and as many shrubs and bushes as you can. They give them out for free. Um, and they'll also work with you. Um, they'll also work with you to provide plants for your gardening projects. So, and they love developing partnerships and they're really good consultants and helping you understand your environment as well. Uh, and then there's Future Harvest, uh, CASA, which is the Chesapeake Alliance for Sustainable, Sustainable Agriculture. And this gives you access to the Chesapeake, because for me personally, it gives me access to, of course, the Chesapeake uh, farmers, you know, uh, in the area. 
so the DMV area from Delaware down to Virginia and give you access to the farmers in the surrounding area. They also have a great uh, beginners farmers program to help give you an idea of the different farming models that's out there. Uh, and because it's not just, you know, just putting uh, uh, plants in the ground and then harvesting them. There are seedlings, you know, you, there's this whole market for, you know, purchasing seedlings because a lot of farmers, they don't have time to grow their own seedlings you can be able to sell them seedlings and help um, or release some burden off their back. Uh, and these systems and these business models uh, create a collaborative effort amongst the community at large and everyone working together and building together, right? And the Baltimore Farm Alliance was another really good institution to help uh, if you on the ground, on the ground in a local sense, have an alliance with other growers and other farmers and working collaboratively together as well. Okay, now securing land. And that's like one of the one of the biggest issues. Like we're, okay, I wanna get in the garden, but I don't have any idea where to find land. Before you even do, you have to find land. Now, where do you find land? So, so these are several options. You could go to um, churches. Churches like have a lot of land. I know the special, specifically here in Baltimore, uh, churches have access to a, farm, a lot of land, but they don't know what to, they don't really have anything to do. They don't know what to do with it per se, but they have secured land. And, and there's all different reasons why they have the land. Uh, you know, they were going to do a project, but never got a chance to do it. You know, things happen. Right. But, you know, it's sitting there. You can always be like, hey, I'd love to start a, a garden uh, with you guys. Let me do it. You know, you know, of course, you can develop a partnership with the with the with the church at large. Uh, gift food or sell food, whatever, how you want to do it. Um, but more than likely, and I, I mean, I have done this, you know, they are more than, they are very arms open and more than willing to build with you and work with you uh, to achieve your vision, right? Um, and taxes. So in Baltimore, um, because most of the plots, they don't exceed like like really an acre or anything. There really isn't an issue with taxation, but it could apply to where you are, right? So that's something to keep in mind in your process of securing your land is that what are some of the, um, uh, what are the taxes? What are the zoning issues that I might have to deal with? Uh, particularly, you know, uh, building permits. Um, so here in Baltimore, there uh, fixed so fixed structures um, like a, like a shed with like a concrete foundation that's past like thirteen feet or something like that. Um, that's something that that you have to get like a bird a building permit for, right? But a hoop house, right, or a green or a, like a greenhouse that you just kind of see on the right side of this picture in the background, it's kind of faded out. That's not considered a fixed structure. So you don't need a building permit for something like that. So understanding what you can build on the land, right? And what you can't is extremely important. And it's not always a can't, it's always maybe just an item right now. And there's, but there's ways of being able to, to reach that and being able to achieve that, right? And then soil safety management. So John Hobbs did a study, uh, not just here in Baltimore, but across statewide, that there is extreme lead issue there's a it is a lead issue in the soil and that's for different things you know uh lead from the gasoline um uh, lead paint uh and this isn't just uh, an issue in the city this is statewide this is even going to the county where there's extreme levels of lead within the soil uh that knowledge is extremely important because maybe you don't want to till in that soil right because then you're bringing up that old soil that has that is like that has ex even more extreme levels in, in, in of lead in it, right? So maybe you need to uh, use some regenerative agricultural practices where you're building up the soil with compost or wood chipping, which is another really good method uh, just to cover that ground and to build the soil up, right? Uh, with with biomatter, uh, which brings up your biodiversity, okay? Uh, so this is really important knowledge because if you want you want to eat food you want you want the food you want to have nutritious food but you don't want it to hurt you so it's it's really good to be aware as to what's in the soil what's happening with the soil you know and what you can do to manage it right and in Baltimore if you're going to take on a new project for example you have to have a soil safety management plan so and which 
again, that go with the urban sustainability, with the, with the sustainability office, they can direct you with where you need to go, who you need to talk to. So it's not, you know, something that you just, you're on your own. So there's plenty, there are resources to help you get to where you want to go. Okay. And then water access, that's another issue. So does your site grant you water access, right? And that's something that you see with a lot of uh, areas. It's like, you know, you want to, you want to start your garden, but you need water, right? So are you, are you going to be able to be, are you going to be forced to bring in, you know, large tubs of water, large containers of water to constantly have to water your plant? Or is there a water main that they, that you could get access to to be able to run a line from that main and to your land so that you can be able to use the water? Here in Baltimore, uh, instead of having like, you know, a skyrocket water bill because water, you know, really costs, right? So for a flat rate of $120 for the whole year, for the whole season, you can have water access. And they're very flexible with you. It'll work with you. Um, so uh, there are... Uh, policies and instruments in play in place to help you really achieve what you want to do, at least here in Baltimore. And if it isn't there, that you know, these are some some things to think about, some policy changes that needs to happen where you are, so that you can also have you know have be able to achieve what you would like. And uh, what are the um, I meant to, uh, excuse the typo, but what are the needs of the land? Uh, what does the land need? Of course, that goes back to soil management. But this is a whole overview. What is the soil management? Uh, water access points. Uh, it does. Is there is there grading that needs to be done? Um, all of these things have to be should be taken into account, and you should want to take them into account so that down the road you're just making your job easier, and it's less of a burden on you as just a gardener or as a farmer, right? And then how to grow from home. So I so it, I brought just three basic examples, right, that I think anybody can do um, uh, from just basic materials. Honestly, you can probably find anywhere around you. Um, and then to the, like, the more detailed is like the hydroponic gardening, right? Uh, so raised beds, of course, you have your basic raised beds, and that can go from however large you kind of want, but you want your depth to be about maybe about a foot or more so that you can be able to really plant in and the seeds. So the seeds can have space to grow, but it's a more of a controlled environment. And this is really good in case you have ground that is contaminated with lead. This is, you literally are building the soil up and providing an environment for your vegetables. So it doesn't even have to touch the, the original soil at all. And uh, you can build a base, build it up, and you can build an artificial environment for your garden, right? And then there's container gardening. So if you're like in an apartment or you have a small space, uh, the, the, the options are there. You can use, you know, you, if you ever go to Home Depot or any, just get a bucket and put some soil, put some holes in there, uh, put some soil in there, put, uh, put your seedlings in there. Um, and you can, you can, you know, and the world is your oyster. Another thing, too, with the container gardening, unlike the raised beds, per se, is that you can you can grow potatoes, you can grow carrots because of that depth. And you can you have it. Of course, you have that artificial environment and you have to build up that soil. But you have a controlled environment, a small controlled environment that you can grow potatoes. You can grow just about anything in this. Right. And then you have hydroponics. They have models now where you can. Um, you can, you know, have it in your kitchen, right? Very nice, little plush, you know, very posh, you know, models. And then you have some in their hallway or some just with some uh, PVC pipe or um, with some holes in it. You run into water at the top, it drains down and dumps out at the bottom and it creates that little small little ecosystem going on. Um, and where there's like no soil, it's just water, uh, whatever, um, uh, uh, nutritional um, uh, liquid nitrogen, you know, excuse me, not liquid nitrogen, but uh, liquid fertilizer that you add in there to help it grow. And that's it. No soil. So if you don't want to get your hands, you know, too dirty and everything, it's another option for you. And, you. and of course, you don't want to get, not really just get your hands dirty or just your apartment. You want to keep things clean or your home. Uh, this is a great way to do it. So this, so, you know, you're not stuck in any box. You can, 
you can, there's many possibilities. Just, you know, be willing to be creative and really dive in and, and have fun. <laughs> That's the main thing has have fun. You know, if, with all this crisis and all this craziness going on, at the end of the day, you know, you know, try to have fun. And this is what we can achieve. You know, with the breakdown of the uh, of the decentralization of our food industry, you know, and with people working collaboratively, you know, what is it just being able to walk down the street? You see some elderberries growing on the tree, or some um, or a peach, or anything like that. You just walking down the street picking fruit. You know what I mean? On your way to school, so kids don't have to go to school hungry, and they can come home with a little something in their stomach. I don't know. This is how I. I envision things that things if we work collaborat collaboratively and work together, this is something that we really could achieve and ease the burden on everyone. Um, so uh, keep have an open mind and visualize the possibilities, right? You know, if so, and in conclusion, you know, we are coming into a new world, a new normal, and with old systems coming to their end. It grants us the opportunity to bring new ideas and the change and, and the change to, and the chance, excuse me, to implement those ideas. So, you know, in closing, we want this even with as daunting as things are looking. And with the always are coming to an end, these systems, you know, everything has their life cycle uh, and the change is going to be tough. Um, maybe not for us as individual personally. But for many around us, it's going to be very difficult. So how can we as individuals alleviate that pain, that, that pain or that suffering? Uh, how can we start to manifest a better world that we're leaving behind? Um, and the only way that we can do that is through each other, through working together, trying to solve problems practically. And, and from there, building a foundation and we can build up from there. And it starts with the youth as well. We have to include them because they are the next generation, generation up. Something I want to keep it that you should keep in mind, right? The average farmer, the age of the average farmer in the United States is uh, anywhere between 58 to 60 years old. That's the age of the average farmer, okay? And everybody, you can't, they can't, they can do not, no one lives forever. And there has to be a generation of farmers going back to the Homestead Act, right? There has to be a generation of farmers to come up to do this work. Because who, if no one's growing, how are people going to eat? <laughs> you know, and these are things, these are things we must think about critically. You know, um, let's take Japan, for example, right? And they're even worse. The average farmer in Japan is 66, 66 to 70 years old. <laughs> that, that, that's not sustainable whatsoever. You know, um, so these are things that we have to think about. And, and I think that um, we're also, you know, unaware uh, of how dire the situation is, but it's bad. It doesn't have to be that, you know, and I think conversations like this is the beginning of that transition and going in a, in a better direction. Great, thank you so much, Floyd, thank you. Um, we do have yes. a ton of questions and very little time. Um, that's okay. a challenge. But so let's try to, or or you should try to answer as many of them as you can in in a, okay. in a short time, short amount of time. Because of course we have still another round, and we want to at least stretch once before we get into the next round. But it was super interesting, okay. and that also why we have so many questions and feedback. And some, some is just uh, understanding questions for terms, because some of the terms are, of course, not known by everybody. And uh, we should always try to explain them. But um, sometimes, sometimes it just happens with uh, with when we get carried away. So CSA, uh, yes. Floyd, if you can just explain uh, not uh, just the uh, words, but what does it mean? Yeah. Oh, uh, my apologies. Uh, community, uh, community supported agriculture. Uh, so uh, basically you get it's for us. It's almost like on a subscription base. Uh, so you pay, let's say, um, you know, $200 for every two weeks or something like that, or um, $200 every month. And you'll get 
a ready box of food so it can be you know uh um and thank you thank you uh it could be um potatoes whatever whatever you can think about that you basically want you know your lettuces uh swiss char potatoes carrots uh onions apples, bread, it can be any of those stock items that you usually would get from the grocery store. And you'll get it organically from the farmer directly. And it's on a subscription level. And they usually do it for at the beginning of the season. So uh, beginning of the subscription, the subscription starts at the beginning of the season, and it'll last you through the whole year, through the whole season. So uh, community supported agriculture. And with this pandemic, uh, I was reading, looking at certain numbers that this has gone, that subscriptions has gone up almost some, some are counting almost 400%. And that's crazy. So people are definitely looking in the direction of community supported agriculture. And wherever you are, I would just type it in into your search engine. And I'm more than sure that there are a farm near you uh, that is providing that kind of service. And then if it isn't, why not you? Or mention to that farm, mention to a farmer near you that this is something that they should consider implementing. You know, so just something that it's it doesn't have to be one away. So, and I hope I answered your question in full. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you did. Thank you so much. And then Aaron has two questions which are related very much to about lead poisoning yeah. or lead contamination in the ground, and it's of course very important when you want to start in an inner city land. So first question is whether there's a way that you know of um, if you can test or determine whether there's lead in the soil prior to procuring land, um, if it's being purchased. That's it's one thing. So do you know this? Does it get actually, is that included in the disclosures? And then the other question is about the raised beds, right? So is a foot of height sufficient to prevent risk of lead contamination in food grown in raised beds? Or do you need more or do you need a separating layer barrier? So I will say, so the one, on the second one, when it comes to the raised beds, you want to have like um, a, um, a, uh, what is it? I can't come into a blank, but um, like a fabric tarp. I can't, I can't I'm not yeah, using like, the right like layer. A, you, Yes, Film. yes, yeah. yes, a, a layer to basically yeah. so that the roots, uh, so in case the roots do get down more than a more than a foot, but usually want to do like 16 inches is the usual kind of like the measure or close to something like that. Um, but you want to um, have some type of border layer so that just in case the roots get down that low, they'll have something to kind of stop it. And one thing to keep in mind too about the lead is that it's not really about it getting in the plant per se. I mean, root vegetables and all of that is different, but uh, usually that's not the concern. It's more so the soil particles getting onto the actual plant. Um, and that's where the lead kind of, from my understanding, and I could be wrong, but it's usually the, the, um, the, the soil particles getting onto the plant. So you have to really wash and process the produce and make sure the soil is off of the plant. And that's how you can prevent any lead contamination. Also with the lead contamination, um, it, it depends on who you're buying the land from or getting the land from, because it's probably not, gonna, not going to be done. Um, uh, and I think this is something that is starting to really take root is that the concerns of lead poisoning. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's, but, you, what you can do is, like, for example, through our sustainability office, they will uh, point you into where you can get soil testing. And that's usually with one of the universities. I know uh, in this region, in this area, uh, everyone usually goes to uh, uh, Penn State to get their soils test. So uh, I know Hawkins, I think they work collaboratively with Penn State or something to that degree uh, for the soil test. Okay, great, great. So that helps too. And then related to this, there's a question coming from Raymond about uh, whether there are actually plants that you can use to um, remedy, yes, to I, fix the soil, to get lead out or other pollutants. I, I, yeah. I believe uh, hemp is a really good one, but um, you know that's a whole other subject when it comes to hemp. But I know, uh, I, I think Seth just added a good one too. And uh, somebody said sunflowers too. Those are really good, really good options. And I think Seth said something 
on that too. I can't pull it up, but he yeah. uh, also gave a pretty good solution to it. Yeah, Seth is typing in micro, uh, no, micro, micro, micro syllabin. Yeah, mediation, oh, a process yeah. using fungi to remediate yes. the, the soil. So very interesting. Yes. So everybody, please have an eye also on the chat. There's a lot happening on the chat that's not being said. But of course, that's not secret. So you can read there. You can read about <laughs> elderberry poisoning and all kinds of uh, interesting topics, including also examples are in the chat about what's happening in Ivanichgrad in Croatia with the urban uh, food landscape. So this is also very interesting. Um, Floyd, thank you yes. so much. 